while I was there, the the famous Halloween costume controversy took place. Where can we play a clip very... of that really fast of the? Yeah, I've the uh, I've pulled that clip actually because I want you to reflect on how this uh, informed your your worldview. The Halloween costume controversy was that a letter uh, had gone out um, uh, suggesting you know us. Uh, um, suggesting culturally sensitive Halloween costumes, and some of the faculty had objected to the idea that administrators would uh, tell co uh, college students who are adults what is appropriate to wear for Halloween. Um, and one of those people was uh, Erica Christakis, whose husband, Nicholas Christakis, uh, was uh, sort of a dean of housing, and he was confronted by a bunch of angry students who thought that administrators should dictate or you know set some parameters for what is and isn't a Halloween costume. And this is a clip from that confrontation provided by uh, FIRE, uh, the uh, free campus free speech group. So let's uh, play that clip. Walk, walk away, walk away. Walk away. Walk away. It doesn't deserve to be listened to. It doesn't deserve to be listened to. I did not. Be quiet. For all students, do you understand that? As your position as master, it is your job to create a place of comfort and home for the students that live in Silliman. You have not done that. By sending out that email, that goes against your position as master. Do you understand that? Then no, I stop. don't agree with that. Then, then why the fuck did you accept the position? Because Who I have the a fuck hired you? I have a different vision. You should you. step down. If that is what you think about being a master, you should step down. Uh, uh, how did, so you, so you were, you were on campus when all that drama unfolded. Uh, how did not, that not only, your... not only was I on campus, but a, I actually saw a part of that interaction unfold from across oh. the street because I lived in the residential college across the street from Silliman. Uh, and B, I was the opinion editor of the Yale Daily News, which meant that I uh not only had to solicit and edit op-eds from angry students uh upset about all the systemic racism allegedly permeating yale but i also had to write the paper's official editorial uh about the protests and the way the editorial process worked was that it was basically just a democratic vote by the the editorial board um, and then the opinion editor had to kind of execute the will of the editorial board and write the the, the op-ed, even if the opinion editor didn't agree with the will of the editorial board. And as happened in this case, right, um, you know, I'm not actually sure it was meaningfully a democratic vote because we got into the meeting to discuss things and it it became clear within seconds that anyone who dissented was going to get called racist and shouted down. So nobody did, even though I think a lot of people privately thought this was going too far, but they didn't say you anything. You didn't dissent either? It was, it was very, very clear that like, if I had, tr I sort of, I tried to gently push back on some things, but it was quite clear that had I pushed it too far, it would have just devolved and the outcome would have been the same, but even worse. Uh, yeah. And so I kind of made a tactical decision. All right, like, you know, I'm not gonna win this fight. So the best I can do is sort of try to moderate whatever we end up writing. Um, so I had to actually write a fawning editorial saying, oh my God, these protesters are so brave. And you know, why does the university you know, should listen to their pain, blah, 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 blah. And then when I tried to even sneak in a line about free speech, uh, what happened was it was being, there was like a Google doc that was, that was effectively being uh, stealth, not stealth edited, but like everyone was looking at the Google doc. So then I, throw in the line and people come over to me and say, I think this sounds, you know, like you're blaming the protesters. How could you? And then that line gets taken out. So it was, it was a shit show. It was terrible. So you're just sitting was, at a keyboard, just sweating, right? You know, carefully yeah, writing yeah. these sentences as if people are watching yeah. the Google doc. That's uh, pretty amazing. I'm not joking. That is what happened. And, uh, <laughs> look, it was, it was, it was a preview of what happened to the New York times and other big media outlets in 2020. Media outlets right. that, of course, employ a lot of alums of the Yale Daily News and the Harvard Crimson and other such. Did this did this radicalize you? Th this is the uh, origin story. 
<laughs> I, 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 you know, radicalized is a bit of a strong word because I, it's not like, it's not like I was a normal, I mean, I was kind of a moderate Democrat who was just pro free speech, but, but, you know, it's not like I was, went from moderate Democrat to, you know, fire breathing MAGA or anything like that. But yeah, it, it, it made me much more concerned about who the future leaders of the country would be. Um, I, it definitely pushed me right and subsequent developments after college further pushed me right. Um, but yeah, this was sort of a inflection point. Maybe maybe radicalization is too strong, but certainly an inflection point in my political trajectory. Well, so I came to college in 2014, same time as you. And I think for me, the environment there was extraordinarily radicalizing to the point that it even inspired me, one could say, to graduate early, which was not my plan to do so because I just had a miserable time on campus. I went to the College of William & Mary and to set the stage for um, old geezers like Zach and uh, our viewers and listeners who might not know, you know, 2014 was a weird time. It was right after, um, I guess, the officer who had uh, stood accused of killing Michael Brown had been acquitted. There were all of these riots related to Ferguson. Ferguson was basically on fire, sort of a precursor to the George Floyd summer 2020 protests. Obviously, we've seen these um, the bubbling ups of the protest movement surrounding cop killings and police brutality in the United States. This was not the first incarnation of it, uh, and it was also not the last one. But 2013, 2014 was a very hot time for that type of thing. And so I recall that fall being really intense on campus for that reason, for all of the racial and police brutality reasons. And then Rolling Stone published the now widely discredited A Rape on Campus um, Rape Hoax Story that basically describes, and I think this was talked about at many college campuses. You know, I went to William & Mary, and obviously this had occurred on UVA's campus, uh, very, very close by, you know, lots of friends there. And so I think it made a huge splash, not just in that sort of college microcosm, but at, on other campuses too, because there was essentially, I think, a little bit of this precursor to Me Too happening, where, you know, suddenly these sort of twin yeah. issues of race relations, police brutality, and campus sexual assault and sexual harassment were sort of not exactly entering the public consciousness, but certainly having this huge moment. And to be 18 years old and to have these two issues where so many people were saying, hey, you're either with us or you're against us. You're either fired up about this or you're, you know, an evil, you know, Trump tar didn't exist yet, but like an evil right winger. Um, it very much made it so I think many people were, were I don't want to say forced into submission, but very much given all of the social incentives to believe what the herd believes, to go with the herd yes. and not their dissent. And I was one of the people I was writing for my college newspaper and dissenting from this. And a lot of activists really made my life hell as a result. It ended up becoming very quickly apparent. It was made apparent quite quickly to me that this would not actually be a healthy thriving place of intellectual discourse. And I should just cut my losses and get the hell out because being part of the working world is so much better. Uh, you know, being an actual journalist <laughs> oh, and being agree. able to engage more thoughtfully with these oh, things. I agree. Right? But did you have a similar experience? Like, were you doing the exact same thing that I was just a little bit North? Yeah, it was, it was similar. Um, I, one time when I was the opinion editor of the paper, I published a op-ed criticizing migration to Europe, which was admittedly, I think, a defensible, but also pretty fire and brimstone restrictionist take um, on the issue. Um, but, you know, we published crazy far left things all the time uh, that were just completely, completely batshit. So I thought, all right, you know, this is a little over the top in the other direction, but that's fine. You know, he's not calling for genocide or anything. Like it's, he's just saying that Europe should stop accepting migrants because they're destroying like the culture of Europe and creating safety issues. Okay, it's a little much, but you know, he can say that. I published it and then a girl came up to me in the coffee shop, like in public and started berating me for publishing the op-ed. Um, and, and to be honest, I didn't care that much because like, what was this girl going to do to me? But but that that I think gives you a sense of what the climate was like. Um, I was lucky that I Yale had a good network of conservative student groups, especially this thing called the Yale Political Union, which contains a lot of conservative political parties. And so 
I, I was in one of those and I kind of had a friend group that I knew was not going to cancel me or disown me. Um, and in fact, within that friend group, I was like the token lib. Um, so if anything, they were like, they'd be like, Aaron, you know, okay, yeah, it's nice that you believe in free speech, but really what you should believe is that we need a Catholic monarch who will suppress free speech in the interest of creating, you know, our lady of Guadalupe empire from, from North America to South America or whatever. Like, like it, it sounds, it sounds like a joke, but there were actually people who believed that. Um, so, you know, they, they all, for me, they were like, oh yeah, you know, you, you, you think that maybe, uh, maybe Title IX is going a little too far, right? Like, oh, you know, you think you're controversial. Well, wait till you hear what we believe. Um, so- How were they treated on campus uh, though? Like, like you're saying there were people they, way weirder than they, you. Well, because they had the social group, like they were fine. They also weren't as outspoken though. Like they weren't writing their takes, committing them to mm -hmm. paper. I think people probably knew that they were Catholic and conservative, but they, they typically, I think we're pretty good about just just knowing when and where to, to share that. So, uh, yeah, look, I, I, I had a similar experience, although I would say that I didn't feel as socially isolated as I think some people felt. And I actually, especially at Yale, where there is this kind of conservative infrastructure, you know, I would probably advise students to be a little less afraid of getting canceled, because as long as you have the friends who won't cancel you, like, it doesn't really matter if someone calls you a mean name on Facebook. It just should learn to get over that. Um, but yeah, look, these 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 universities often do have uh, a very stifling climate for for free speech. And I do know people at other uh, elite schools um, where there was not, I think, as healthy a network of dissident students. And at those schools, people who spoke out really, re you know, faced a, a steep social price. Um, yeah, no, it's it's a it's a problem. Um, and so and and you asked earlier, do I think there's anything to the conservative critique? Well, having seen it up close, I mean, yeah, you know, these, you you really will see kids get piled on for saying things that are, if anything, way to the left of Fox News, but just not quite to the left of Bernie Sanders. And you know, you don't see anything like that pile on um, triggered by students saying that rationality is a tool of white male oppression, which someone literally wrote almost exactly that in an op-ed for me that I had to edit, right? I was sitting next to the girl and it, editing it with her line by line. And the thesis of the op-ed was that demands for rational discourse are a way of policing the emotionality of women of color, right? Like, it's pretty crazy. And, you know, that was what you were expected to say. Oh, that's an important perspective. Thank you so much for writing this op-ed. Like, no, I mean, come on. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our new show, Just Asking Questions. You can watch another clip here or the full episode here. New episodes drop every week, so subscribe to Reason TV's YouTube channel to get notified when that happens or to the Just Asking Questions podcast on Apple, Spotify, or any other podcatcher.